Hello and welcome to episode 117 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the fast attack submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 at Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this fine morning, Bill? I'm doing great. I'm trying to learn how to pronounce Metanicow today. So we're going to you got it. You nailed it. That, right? <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. Yeah. Uh, this week, we'd like to welcome back our friend Dave Holland. Dave is a former United States Marine, owns and runs a Facebook and YouTube channel called Guadalcanal Walking and Battlefield. He's a Solomon Islands battlefield guide. And most importantly, yet again, we said this before, and it rings true every single time a Guadalcanal expert. Welcome back, Dave. Glad to have you, man. Oh, glad to be back and I'm looking forward to our chat again. Oh, yeah. We got some good stuff to talk about today. A very inspiring story among many of the inspiring stories around Guadalcanal is one of the ones we're going to hit today. Uh, but anyway, back to what we're going to talk about today. This week, we'll be talking about the early actions that occurred along the Matanacow River. Uh, now, as opposed to the land battles we've discussed before, Tenaru and Edson's Ridge uh, specifically, uh, they each only really happened one time, uh, those specific battles. Uh, the Matanikau actions, however, occurred several times from September all the way even through November, actually even in August, if you want to be technical. Uh, today, we'll be focusing just on the September and the October actions, however. Uh, following the Battle of Edson's Ridge, what remained of the Japanese force under General Kawaguchi pulled back through the jungle and attempted to regroup as well as refit on the western side of the Matanikau River. Uh, Marine General Archer Vandergriff was aware that the Japanese had done this very thing and planned to eliminate whatever was left of that force that had slammed against the ridge on two consecutive nights in September. Uh, Vandergriff was determined to mop up what was left of the Japanese so as to deny them the opportunity cons to consolidate their forces and resume their offensive. Uh, Vandergriff chose his freshest troops for this action, those being the recently arrived 1st Battalion of the 7th Marines, under a lieutenant colonel whose name was and still is synonymous with the Corps, Lewis B. Chesty Puller. So, guys, let's talk about uh, the 7th Marines. Uh, they're, they're new to the field of battle. They're new to this adventure called Guadalcanal. Uh, they were on Samoa before, and they arrive in September, not long after Edson's Ridge, right, Dave? Yeah, <clears throat> like you said, they were um, they were sent out initially because they um, they thought the Japanese were going to continue their offensive uh, through the Southwest Pacific, so they had to garrison the islands very quickly. So, the Seventh Marines was uh, originally part of the the First Marine Division, right. one of the three infantry regiments, being the First, the Fifth, and the Seventh Marines. Well, the Seventh Marines was fleshed out very quickly with some of the best NCOs and officers in the division because they were thought they were going to be the first to fight, and they shipped them. Um, very quickly to British Samoa. So they arrived on Samoa and they uh, joined the 8th Marines there and some more um, units and formed one of the, I think, 3rd Marine Provisional Brigade. So they were garrisoning the unit there waiting for the Japanese advance. Um, and <clears throat> so you had Puller, H.H. H. Hannikin, um, and other uh, legends it seemed to be, but they were two of the biggest legends at the time. So they were in the 7th um, and then Obviously, the, the 1st Marine Divisions, uh, the rest of the regiments were the first to fight on 7th of August. So you can imagine how Puller and Hannikin and a lot of these uh, veteran NCOs, thinking they were going to be the first to fight, uh, kind of missed the show. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> when they arrived on the, the 18th of September, they were ready to and raring to go with the, uh, the fight. In fact, one of the, the good stories about Puller, it's told uh, several different versions, but when Puller landed, his version was he landed on the beach, First thing he said was, where's the Japanese? Um, and someone handed him a map and he looked at the map and he says, oh, I can't make heads or tails of this. Just point me out where the Japanese. And they pointed to the hills. He said, that's where I'm going. Another story, um, especially by Lieutenant Colonel Twining, one of his uh, good mm -hmm. friends, Earl Twining, Twining. Yep. met him on the beach. He said, oh, Puller, about time you uh, showed up. You know, you, you missed the fight. You, about time you showed up. Or where you been sitting on the beach somewhere? And they all started laughing at him. In Samoa, worse, there are worse places to sit on the beach. <laughs> yes. But the Seventh Marines were the, uh, were the first real big reinforcement that Vandergriff had um, received. Mm -hmm. So they were very well trained, very fresh, um, and it gave him the his full complement um, with his division. Even his though he did division. have the Second Marine Regiment, which was uh, loaned to him, but they were mainly garrison to Lagi at the time. But he gave him that chance, like you mentioned, Ford, um, to actually um, 
have a 364 perimeter right and also give him a bit of offensive element uh, fresh unit so he could push out and um, support his uh, active defense and there's a, there a bunch of logistics that arrived with him too right yes. finally after being uh, in this austere conditions the marines were operating under before this Right. Oh, yeah. There, there was about 4,000 um, guys landed. I mean, it was also there was a whole battery of our battalion of the of the 11th Marines, uh, which was the artillery. They were attached with them. Um, a lot of engineer units. Um, the when they landed, the parachute battalion left. Um, there wasn't much, much uh, of them. There's a whole manifest list I have. And it was just amazing. It was the first big resupply in the two meals a day that the Marines were on kind of ceased and they started eating I three meals again. Normally you could call but, it, but. but i'm confused again but with the para battalion the paramarines were first on tulagi right and were there, were they split was there some on guadalcanal as well well they pulled them off they were, yeah. you know, they pulled. They were in gabutu and tanibogo it's which okay right right seventh and eighth of august they hit there and then mm -hmm. they, they merged them with the first raider battalion but okay by the time of after bloody ridge and there wasn't much left of them they'd been decimated because um, I wasn't a full battalion size anyway. Mm -hmm. you know, when the battle started, a couple of companies. Okay. Yeah, probably you, you say three, three or four mm -hmm. um, companies on normal strength size. And, so I think you, I forgot the exact number. They were down to less than probably 100. They got wow. on the ship. Incredible. It, it's important to note, and you, you, you mentioned it here just a second ago, Dave, is that this the arrival of the 7th is the first major reinforcement. They'd gotten people here and there. And like you said, you know, we talked about in another episode, they brought the Raiders over, the Paramarines came over from Tulagi and, and Gubudu and places like that. But this is the first real sizable reinforcement. And not only did they bring men, they brought some supplies. You know, the food uh, instances were, were one thing. They brought some vehicles. They being, the you know, that convoy with 7th Marine brought some vehicles. They brought some fuel. They, this is the first major reinforcement for the Marines there. And the big thing to note here is what you said earlier is it allowed Vandergrift to form a 360 degree perimeter. And that's something I think people don't understand is that, you know, up until this time, they didn't have enough people to do that. You know, the, the, Vandergrift did not have enough people to properly defend the area that they had captured. Now he does. And not only does he have that ability to defend, he also, as you said, Dave, he's got the ability to kind of get out there and, and, poke the bear a little bit here, which is something he does in very short order. He sends the seventh out pretty quickly. But before we get to that, we talked about Chesty Puller. He he is, you know, when people think of the United States Marine Corps, he's probably one of the first guys that they think about. He's iconic. Yeah, he is. He or was, he, you know, and, and it's not that, you know, the Marine Corps is not short of legendary heroes. <laughs> But it's just that Puller, for whatever reason, is the first people, first one of the first people that people think about. Well, he was Ooh. he was Hollywood. I mean, he's a Hollywood. He was. Yeah. Uh, you know, he he looked the part, he acted the part, uh, he, he played the part. He was a was, Marine's Marine. He really and, was. And he had the he had the courage. And and as you said, Dave, where's the enemy? That's where I'm going. Yeah. So you know, from beginning to end, he was um, an iconic Marine. So, so when he lands on Guadalcanal, he's about he's 44 years old at the time. If I, if yeah, yeah, he is. He's 44. Okay. He joins the Marines in 1918. Chesty Puller does. Um, and he was born in 1900, so he was right. 18 years old when he joined. And this is well, that, that doesn't work. No, no, 1898. Yeah, yeah. 1898. Yeah, yeah. So, so he'd served 24 years in the Corps by the time he arrives on Guadalcanal, <laughs> and he is not your green as grass. CO. He he had seen actions in the Banana Wars uh, in Haiti and Nicaragua Nicaragua. He'd gotten at least one or or did he did he get two of his Navy crosses before? Navy crosses in the Banana Wars. Yeah. yeah. He was already a legend before he even arrived on Guadalcanal. Right. And he was there was a description that I read um that Martin Clemens wrote of him, of Chesty Puller. He said he was uh prototypical marine corps officer he had a chin like a bulldozer blade <laughs> a barrel chest and seemingly always had a pipe stuck in his mouth and he does if you look at pictures of him more often than not he's chewing on a pipe and he's got this i mean you know it's very abundantly clear why he got the name chesty it looks like he's got a beer barrel around his chest and he's not fat he's just he's built like you know a marine corps bulldog 
the thing is with Chesty Puller, and I knew a lot of seventh Marines who served under him. And I know you did at some point too, Dave, that everyone who served underneath that man absolutely adored him from officers to privates. I mean, they worshiped the ground that he walked on and would do anything, anything that he asked of them without hesitation. And I mean, that that is the sign of an excellent, excellent, excellent leader that that you can command that kind of dedication without really doing much aside from just walking around and being one of the guys, you know. Yeah, he was an enlisted, uh, enlisted Marines officer, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was in, not wanting to jump ahead, but he, he ends up being in just about every major battle in the Pacific theater operations, right? Um, uh, I can't... The well, the, the first Marines up to, up until, once again, most of them did three uh, campaigns, mm -hmm. and then they were sent back either to the States or to, to do something else. They'd get them out of combat. So Puller served up into uh, Peleliu. And then right. once again, Peleliu's another story, and you guys will get to that a bit later than what happened to, to Puller on Peleliu. Mm -hmm. um, but Puller, we'll find out later in our discussion with some of the guys in the second time, the 5th Marines at the mouth of Matanikau, uh, how they felt. But we'll wow. leave yeah. that to a bit later. Yeah. If, if there's one blemish on Puller's World War II record, it would be Peleliu. And, yeah, and, and in my right. professional opinion, he, he, he and, and again, we're getting a little far ahead, but he he pushed the 1st Marine Regiment. You know, he he bled him white on the Umar Brogel, but that's another conversation for another day. Yeah. Back to Guadalcanal. Um, so Puller gets there. Vandergrift immediately decides to utilize his people and assigns Puller a mission. Um Dave, let's talk about this mission. This is previous. Or this is just before the September uh, crossing of the Matanikau. Actually, this is what results in the September crossing of the Matanikau. What is his mission that that uh, Vandergrift tells him he wants him to do? What does he What does he say? Hey, Puller, do this. What does he say? All right. So Puller, being the probably the best trained battalion um, that he had, because I call him. He wanted a battalion to kind of replace the Raiders. He had the Raiders there at the time, but Raiders are starting to get uh, spin out. So he wanted his uh, good uh, maneuver uh, battalion under a good aggressive commander. So one seven fit the bill. So he sent one seven basically on a reconnaissance in force. So he had it, on Guadalcanal at the time you had, we, I think we discussed it before. You had one, uh, I wouldn't even really call it a road. They call it a track. It was the government track or coastal track. And it went obviously up the coast. Then to another time parallel in that at the, um, slopes, northern slopes of Mount Austin, or the grassy um, knoll, Grass. as it was called, the mm -hmm. part of the campaign. There was east-west trail. Um, I can't pronounce it in Japanese, but the Japanese had a word for it. I can't pronounce it. It started with the M. You know, that was the main trail that the Japanese had used, especially Kawaguchi's brigade, on the withdrawal back to the Matanikau. And that east-west trail basically went from the Lunga River, which was in the marine perimeter. It went in a westerly from east to west as the marines traveled it um parallel in the coastal track on the other side of a, a major ridge line so basically his task was to go down that east west trail following the same track that the uh, the japanese had retreated down once he um it went there crossed the matanikau river uh, the only really there's two crossing points but the main crossing point was at the uh, sandbar that's where the government track uh, went over the uh, matanikau the Japanese, probably about 15 to 1600 yards uh, upstream, had the Nippon Bridge or the One Log Bridge. It was a large banta tree. And, you know, the banta trees, you've probably seen photos of them uh, in Guadalcanal. It's just a large jungle top tree. And it apparently it had been felled uh, over to Matanikau in a small, uh, narrow part. And that was where the Japanese had crossed back and forth. So the East West Trail went um, there and it went down into a place called the Valley. And later in, and I think in the story, we'll talk about the Valley, which was made famous in a, in a book called Into the, or Into the Valley by John Hersey, a war correspondent. So it went into the Valley and it went down into the um, Matanikau to cross the bridge. So what Puller was going to do, reconnaissance and force, go down the east-west track, cross the Matanikau. Once he hit the Matanikau, then the first raider battalion, that was the signal for them to advance down the coastal track, basically paralleling. Meet up with Puller, push through 17, and go to a place called Cucumbona, which was a village, probably another four miles down eastern 
uh, side, or sorry, the western side of the Natanakau. Mm -hmm. And there, they will form a, a patrol base. And the first it's on the eastern the it's on the eastern side of the Matanakau, uh, right? Oh, western, to the western side of western? Matanakau. Okay. Yeah, but Kukum Bonneville. Kukum Bonneville, so that was yeah, oh, right, Japanese, right. yeah, the Japanese had been landed there, and that was kind of their central focus point. Okay. So what, what Vandegriff wanted to do, he wanted to push the Japanese far away from the airfield to mm -hmm. give them a bit of a bu buffer zone. And he thought if he could form a, a major patrol base at Kukum Bona, that would keep the Japanese well, especially on the um, western side, well far away from the airfield. And that was his so, intent. So Puller and 1-7 are, are traveling west when they cross the Matanakau? Yeah, they're going down okay. the east west trail, traveling yeah. west to cross the Matanakau. Once they cross the Matanakau, then the first raiders are going to come through and form a major patrol base at Kukum Bona. Okay. So how far inland are they when they're doing this? Uh, I'd say... Less than a mile, I'd say probably about a mile. Okay, a mile from the coast. So you, so you go from the coast. But that's, yeah. You're far enough to get yeah. lost in the jungle. That's kind of the point. Oh, yeah. yeah. So they're on the northern slopes. I mean, I wish I had a map, but the northern slopes mm -hmm. of Mount Austin. Right. So they're okay. basically traveling northern slope. That was a Japanese trail that had built the East West Trail. Mm -hmm. So they're traveling down there, and they they took off about the 23rd of um, around the 23rd of September. Mm -hmm. That's when they they punched out. Got it. Now you said you said it was a reconnaissance in force, and it certainly was that. I mean, he he put out he being Vandegrift put out several hundred guys in this reconnaissance in force, and it's you know they move out on the twenty third, and on the afternoon of the following day, so this would be twenty four September, the lead elements of Puller's group uh, they ran into a Japanese bivouac area on the uh, northwestern slope of Mount Austin, and then there's a pretty sharp firefight right there, and there it's it's pretty nasty pretty quick yes yeah i've been to that that site there was um, in a couple of areas he had two companies so puller being a banana war marine especially in that thick jungle puller always led from the front well, i wouldn't say he was the front guy but he was like the fourth or fifth back probably not the best place uh, for a battalion commander once again they were these are well trained but green troops and puller was the guy who always wanted to be up front and he could um if we hit an ambush, he could react very quickly, deploy his forces very quickly. So they were traveling in Indian file. So he had a whole battalion, roughly. He'd left his heavy guns back, uh, <clears throat> such as the heavy machine guns and his 81 millimeter mortars. He'd left them back, but he had the rest of the battalion there. So they're traveling in single file. Puller was probably about four or five or six person back. And he had a few flankers out, and um, Pullers were with the scouts. So they came upon some rice. Um, cooking over fire or, or had rice fires going. They, I think they flushed out, as Puller called it, a few Japanese, and they ran away, and they left their cooking um, fires with their, their rice. And the story was uh, that Puller had seen the, the rice, bent down and started sampling some of it, said, this isn't bad rice, and that's when machine guns started opening up. And apparently, um, I don't know if this has been confirmed or it's just a good Marine's um, war tale, but one of the bullets hit the rice pot that Puller was eating out of. <laughs> and then that, that started the firefight, and he had his two companies, and he started maneuvering in his companies, and A and B. He started doing the, the enveloping and, and flanking movements. And he'd only been ashore about, what, five days at this point? They landed on the 18th, yeah. Yeah, so and that, the they landed, they, they sent them, the next day, they sent them, on, they sent them up to um, man the Bloody Ridge area, and that's where the mm. seventh always manned that southern line. And Puller and, and actually the Raiders had done a small reconnaissance patrol up the uh, Lunga River. But yeah, they they used them from the second day. So and this was, this wasn't just skirmishing. This was um, fairly mm -hmm. just rigid uh, attack, wasn't it? It, it, it was. Firefight. Yeah, it was. And and the thing was, and this this will play into what happens after that is that Puller's people take some pretty significant casualties. They lose seven guys there, and by lose I mean killed in action. And then there's twenty five. I think it's 25, yeah, 25, 25, 25 wounded. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's mm -hmm. fairly significant for a little short, sharp action. And it, I guess you could call it a victory because the Marines do push the Japanese out of this area, but that's, that's a lot of people to lose in a very short amount of time towards the end of a day. And that, that, that hinders things from here on out. Um, the next part of this operation was that two, five plays a, uh, a, an important part in this, don't they, Dave? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take one step back there. Um, mm -hmm. 
when I'm on the battlefield in that area, I tell that story. I'll take uh, some of the guys up on the ridge and I point out where this occurred. Um, and then I mentioned that Puller sent two whole companies back with his wounded. Mm -hmm. He had 25 wounded, so he sent roughly over 200 men back with him. And I could tell very quickly the, <clears throat> the ones who I'm – um, giving this tour to or giving this information to that's never actually carried a stretcher carry through the jungle because of, um, generally in every group there's someone who says well, why do they take 200 guys that carry about 25 and I know right off the bat that person's never carried a stretcher mm -hmm. but even on a flat 100, 100 yard football field because it's very hard work and these guys that was the you know the days before the obviously the helicopters there was no roads mm -hmm. were, they couldn't get jeeps up to them so they're at that stage, oh, they're probably a good mile, if that, from the from the perimeter. So they had to yeah. carry these guys back. Then they had to rotate the, the four stretcher carriers. Then they had to provide security. So that's why they, he sent back two of his um, two out of his three companies and left him with C Company, and then two five. <clears throat> he basically got a message back to Vandegrift, and Vandegrift said, "Puller, do you want to pull back or continue?" And Puller, basically being Puller, he goes, "I want to continue, obviously, but I need some more, mm -hmm. yeah. more help here." So yeah, I, I helped carrying a stretcher on 9/11 at the Pentagon, and just a couple hundred yards over open grass, there were six of us, and it, it beat the heck out of me. And it's just, it, it, I can't imagine doing it through jungle. It'll wear you out. Yeah, and you would have been under a lot of adrenaline too, I imagine, sir. So yeah, that yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. hard, hard thing. So, so two five does. You know, he requests uh, puller requests. Uh, oh, I'm losing reinforcements. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, brain sludge. Two five does come up, and um, but at the same time, the Japanese had established a defensive position around the one log bridge. Uh, and I, I, lo I love that Rich Frank describes one log bridge. He says, and I'm paraphrasing, he says it was called one log bridge because comma, well, it was. <laughs> it was one log. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they consolidated that evening. They buried their dead, and I've been to the area where they, they buried the dead. Um, so they buried the dead on some hilltops. Um, they consolidated there, and then they moved out the next morning. So they moved out the next morning, which is the um, 25th. So they moved down and they moved past the area where the long one log bridge was. At that stage, there was no Japanese there. Mm -hmm. So they moved down. Um, there was, it was changing a little bit of uh, fire, a couple of mortar rounds and a few rifle rounds, but it was no uh, active. No fight. Yeah. So they've passed the area of the one log bridge. There was no Japanese there. And they continued down to the mouth of Matanikau. And then, and Basically, that's where they they uh, arrived with two five and C Company. Once they arrived there, then they, they called for the first battalion or sorry, the first Raiders to join them. And then after they the the Marines had passed that area, then then Japanese pushed a whole um, not a whole company, but uh, a number of Japanese, roughly a reinforced platoon across the um, the river and left the other two platoons. I think it was the ninth company or the twelfth company or the one twenty fourth. Yeah, which was the 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 guys or our friend old friend Colonel Oka mm -hmm. that yep. we um, visited in the last episode. Yeah, it's 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 the twelfth company is the guys that are on that on that side of the river, and um, like you said, Puller heads downstream. Um, he's headed towards the mouth of the river, and they attempt a crossing right there. Is it two five? Is put they're at the front, are they not? Yeah, two fives the the guys they're that trying to push across. Yeah, are mainly E and G companies. Mm -hmm. And they're met by some pretty heavy fire, aren't they? On the on the, by the Japanese. The Japanese throw down some throw a lot of lead on that other side of the river, don't they? Yeah, just like I mentioned before, the main crossing point uh, mm -hmm. pre-war and at that stage too mm -hmm. was the sandbar, mm -hmm. which became quite famous um, throughout the campaign, the sandbar of the Matanical. So that was the main area that the Marines tried to to push across. So the Japanese had that uh, dug in quite well. Um, one of the other companies of the 124th. And they met a lot of resistance and they suffered a lot of casualties. And that's why if you speak to all the veterans of the second battalion, the fifth Marines are not that well impressed with, with Puller because they didn't know Puller. Puller um, wasn't their battalion commander. This is the first time most of them had ever met him. And they said, this guy's just trying to kill us. He's trying to push us across this river. You know, obviously um, we're getting hit. 
but once again, that's from a a, a private uh, uh, PFC's point of view. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they don't see the big picture. Only thing they know is that someone's just sending them off to get killed. So obviously, sometimes aggressive uh, tactics work, and sometimes they don't work. In this so case, you've got, they're working. So you've got two five. You've got the elements of one seven that are left after he sends uh, two companies back with his wounded, and you've got some raiders. The Raiders are, were coming up at this stage. They hadn't uh, okay. arrived on the scene, but they'd been called mm-hmm. up. But Poe's in overall time. command because Edson hasn't this, arrived yet? Yes, this stage, he is in overall command. Okay. And then we just have the, the Sacred Time 5th Marines and the C Company are the mm-hmm. ones. Mm-hmm. All right. Once uh, the next day on the 27th at first light, uh, the, Ra- the Raiders are there by now. Are they not on the 27th? Yeah, I think they arrived on the afternoon of the twenty sixth. Yeah, and and when when that comes, when they come in, Merritt Edson of Edson's Ridge, uh, he is an overall command. He he takes over for Puller, does he not? Yeah, so he, he becomes overall command and makes Puller his um, kind of executive officer. Exo, yeah. oh, he's he's senior to Puller. I, I didn't realize that. Yeah, he's a colonel. He's a full colonel. Oh, he's a, um, okay. Puller, lieutenant. Colonel. lieutenant. Yeah, that's right. When Puller took over uh, one seven, I think mm-hmm. in forty. 40- 41. He was a major. Well, so they get uh, on the morning of the 27th, the Raiders are now, they they are trying to push back towards the one log bridge area and cross the river there, right? Yeah, so basically what happened was the, the information got back to um, the D3, which is the planning. At that stage, it was Twining. Twining had taken over from uh, Thomas Thomas then became the, once the then again with the, the shaking up of the, the house, so to speak. Um, Caper James was a, the um, the chief of staff mm-hmm. for Vandegrift. Mm-hmm. So he made Thomas, who was the planning's officer, he made him his chief of staff, trying to come up as D3. So trying to come up with a quick plan on the run, they called it. It wasn't a bad plan. So the plan was the, the, the um, second battalion of the 5th Marines under Puller, was going to basically push across the um, mouth of Matanikau in a holding action to trap the, and hold those Japanese there. The Raiders were going to come down across at the one log bridge and to do an envelopment, hit the Japanese on the right flank. And at the same time, once the word that the, the Raiders had crossed the Matanikau, then the other elements of Puller's battalion, which was back at the, the perimeter, which we had A, B, which is the two rifle companies and elements of D company, which was the um, weapons yes, uh, company mm-hmm. under a, a fellow named Ortho Rogers, who was the battalion executive officer. Um, they were then going to take uh, amphibious assault. And envelop from the seaboard. Yeah, envelop, envelop it from the rear on the um, Western yeah. side of Point Cruz and coming from mm-hmm. behind the Japanese. So you'd have the Japanese trapped in a the pocket. Then they were going to wipe the pocket out. So that yep. was an overall a uh, quick plan they did. Mm-hmm. But as all plans usually, as as was told to me several times, you know, plans never are survive contact with the enemy. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly kind of what happens here. Uh, the Raiders go down and they run smack into those Japanese that are sitting on the other side of that river. And it starts to get pretty nasty, pretty, pretty quick. It, uh, the, the Raiders for all their, you know, expertise in, in in infantry combat as was shown on the ridge they run smack into a hard defense and they are pinned down they're they're the japanese are holding them down right there and they're unable to really do much of anything right there back on the airfield there was a major air raid mm-hmm. and one of the um japanese uh, bombs hit one of the um uh, radio networks and knocked out their uh command and control so to speak and Obviously, in the confusion of combat, the word had got back to the um, command and control back at the um, division headquarters that the Raiders were across the river. The Raiders had made it. That they had succeeded. So move on to the next phase. Yep. So that was the signal. (laughs) But it wasn't true. Amphibious amphibious hook. Okay. Amphibious guys in Fort. In fact, Ortho Rogers, who was on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Ortho Rogers, I'll I'll mention Ortho Rogers now. He was. Kind of a tragic case. What happened to him? And we'll discuss it in a minute. Um, but he was the executive executive officer of Puller. So Puller Puller wasn't an admin guy. He wasn't a paper man. He used to say. So he obviously, as being a good commander, what he did, he, he put a, someone underneath him. He was the 
to Ed Meenan and Piper Man, which was Ortho Rogers. He was uh, kind of the, the staff officer, the, the personnel, the admin officer for Jesse Puller. Puller was the fighter. And, you know, he didn't want to do the Piper work. And I think Puller actually said Piper work would ruin any good military force. And, mm-hmm. and Hannikin was the same way. Hannikin was the other battalion commander, 27. They were both banana war guys. So he was imagine, to- imagine what if Puller would have had to put up with if they had PowerPoint back then. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't have survived. Those old, old guys. Right? Yeah, we, we are men of action. We don't do PowerPoint. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez. I'm not going to imagine it. But Ortho Rogers was the um, post, one of the uh, worked for the Postal Service in Washington, D.C. He was a good reserve officer. He's a good trainer, apparently. So anyway, Ortho Rogers had got, he was in the church service back at the Lunga Perimeter. He got out of his uh, fatigues and put on a, a, his nice um, tan sh- dress his shirt. And, boot yeah. and yeah, he was getting mm-hmm. ready for a church service. And these guys were told very quickly, okay, jump on the boats, jump on the boat. So they, and he had to, he's still in his good Sunday, I guess best you could call it. And they gave a quick briefing to his two um, uh, captains mm-hmm. and they got on the boats. And then the boats were at Cookham, which was the boat basin. And the boat basin, this is where the U.S. Coast Guard comes in. Many yeah, right. of you are aware of the U.S. Coast Guard did a, a fought overseas in many, many a campaigns, and especially in, in World War II. You know, mm-hmm. they, they were the guys that manned all the boats. So in this case, the, the Coast Guards manned the landing craft. And he had a USS Monson. Sometimes um, on some of the old um, documentation, I think it's the Ballard or something. Oh, there's a Ballard or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a mix up there. The the Marine Corps or the Navy actually said uh, post war battle maps of the air. They called it the USS Ballard, and it it was not. It was actually absolutely it was the USS Monson. 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 Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You're right. Well, Monson. Here. Monson was obviously given. Uh, they were given some. Um, Naval gunfire support. And they were been up there on on the first day, kind of soften up some of the Japanese positions. So the Monson was was hanging offshore, and then he had a Cookham boat basin, and he had these um these boats ready to go under the Coast Guard, and and Puller. Is this the time to mention when the Puller goes back or? Set yeah, the yeah. So so well, <laughs> well well let's let's kind of set the stage a little bit because this is this is an incredible story here, and it's true. <laughs> It, this is not a myth. This is yeah. This most is of Puller's incredible stories are true. That's the amazing thing yeah, about it. This this is just badass, straight up. Mm. So they're they're under and, and again, this kind of set the stage. The the Japanese are holding off the Raider assault upstream um, over there by the one log bridge area. Two five is basically stopped right there at the the sand spit right there at the mouth of the river. Uh, there's been a screwed up communication that that the the marines back at the perimeter think that puller is across or, the, or edson rather is across the river that is not the case they send these marines down and and they are from one seven the a a company b company and d company to do the amphibious assault the envelopment that we had talked about earlier um and again dave just to put it just to set it up the uss monson is escorting was it 10 or like 12 landing craft something like that it's, it's close to a dozen landing craft isn't it yeah yeah it was the the, the normal um landing craft i think a couple of tank lighters they call them at the time yeah. so basically when the marines landed when the first marines landed they didn't meet um a fire from the beach they landed on a pole so to speak and as soon as they landed they were a bit a few hundred yards off so ortho rogers wanted to know what was going on so if you if you go to Guadalcanal to this day, where all the main tourist hotels are, is was roughly the beach where they landed. Mm-hmm. So they landed, they went to the first high ground, which is um, Hill 84 or Lankiki Ridge, as some of the people who live in Honiara today might know it. So they went up to the first, um, they, 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 when they went through, there's passing a Japanese bivouac, but they didn't see too many Japanese around. They said, what is these Japanese? They made it up to the top of the ridge to find out what was going on. Um, then that's when the Japanese Oka had formed a plan. He had one um, company on the other side of the Marines, and he had the company that was at the mouth. He sent some of those guys back to try to trap the Marines. He said, we got them in a trap now. And then they started especially hitting the Marines on Hill 84 on the, um, the eastern point. That's when they started taking a lot of fire. Unfortunately for um, Ortho Rogers, in the very opening stages of this major fight, he called a command group with his two captains and some of his lieutenants. And 
uh, one of the veterans had pointed out the area later where this occurred because he was a sergeant at the time he was walking up to this command group and um, if you go on to my um, one of my videos it's called uh the little dunkirk action i actually show you in there where where ortho rogers where this incident occurred so ortho rogers had called his command group together and the eyewitness reports was a japanese knee mortar round landed basically right between ortho rogers feet um, basically uh, almost literally blew him in half and severely wounded one of the other captains and a couple of the other marines so they were down their command right off the bat and then the japanese started hitting them left and right so they were all pinned down and, th and this is almost i mean this is within a few minutes yeah we were probably about 15 or 20 minutes after they land to, yeah. to make the top of the ridge and work out what was going on then the japanese trap just closed in on them boom yeah and they're and they're surrounded pretty quickly um really there's a guy named charles kelly captain kelly he he assumes command after rogers is killed and help me out here dave he he tries to or decides to radio for help but they didn't bring their radios did they no there was a, a sergeant named raisebrook he was one of the main communicators and he left the in the haste and you think well how can this happen but sometimes yeah. obviously they wasn't that plan everything this plan was on the fly, so to speak. And these things kind of happen. Radios in those days wasn't that great anyway. I mean, sometimes the radios, it wasn't like modern radios. Even in, even radios um, in, in the Vietnam era, where you at least you had a, a PRC-25 on your back, you could, man, these things were large. Um, it took three or four guys to carry them, and they wasn't that lightweight. And they did have the walkie-talkies, they call them, but they mainly relied on field phones or field phone wires in those days. So the radios wasn't um, that reliable. But it, nevertheless, they didn't carry any communication with them um, apart from some flags. So they've landed there. They're trying to get the message back that we're trapped. The vision don't know what's going on. Um, even Edson and Puller don't even know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So they're in a pretty bad pickle right now. So they do something that, that again, it sounds like it's something out of a movie, but it, but it's true. They start, they being the Marines, basically write a signal in the ground using their clothing and, and what what fabric they have to spell out the world word help and it just so happens that there is an sbd uh a dauntless dive bomber airborne at that time from vmsb 231 piloted by a guy named dale leslie who is in the air he no i mean you can see the battle going on he looks down and he sees the word help is he there to provide close air support or just is he in transit I think he was in transit. I I wow. do not believe because he was not armed because yeah. from what I've been able to find when I was able to read about him and his sp specific orders is that he was not armed. His aircraft, mm -hmm. or if it was armed, it had yeah, expended yeah. its ammunition. Yeah. Uh, you know, And by that, I'm talking about bombs. And like, yeah, to your point, Dave, they have machine guns on that, but that's not why he was there. He just happened to be there at that time. It's one of those right place, right time kind of moments. Uh, he sees this notification you know help hey hello please and immediately he relays that message via radio for, or he has his rear seat man do that um immediately like he doesn't even wait to get back to henderson field he says hey you know there's a problem going on down here y'all y'all need to do something about this and you need to do about do something about it now essentially is what he says um and, and this, that get word gets to division and then division figures out well those are pullers people is well that how I, it goes down I'm a little confused here too because I read three different accounts that said three different things at the same time. Mm -hmm. That the SBD pilot sends a message. That is without a doubt. That's yes, absolutely 100%. Puller hears the message from Edson. And then I've also read that Vandergrift hurt, not Vandergrift. Um, you mentioned him before, the communications officer um, back there at the perimeter, I'm Thomas. Well, Thomas was chief of staff. Yeah, so, some somebody somebody back there in in Edson's headquarters hears it, and you know there's like the a what you know kind of a thing going on because like you know we didn't think that this was going on, and there's a bit of commotion here. I don't really think that there is any kind of definite answer, but the word does get back to Chesty Puller that your people are surrounded over here on this hill, and things are going south pretty quickly. What does? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. Yeah. So basically. It, it, yeah, the word had got back to Puller. Puller was um, then spoke to Edson. He says, well, my battalion's trapped. Let's keep pushing and pushing. That's my, my boy, so to speak. Um, 
I think, obviously, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall in the command post at that stage. But it obviously, Edson, for some reason, I think he was just trying to um, uh, work out a plan, but it wasn't quick enough for Puller. Edson says, no, I'm not pushing across. I'm not sending 2-5 across the river. Let me just think about this. He says, you're not leaving my guys to die. So I think Puller just took it upon himself. He went back to, to Cookham. Uh, I guess he jumped on a Jeep or a truck and made it back very quickly where the boat basin was. Uh, he met the, uh, the Coast Guard. Um, he says, we're going back to get my guys out. Then he jumped on the USS Monson. He took a launch out to the, the, the destroyer, the Monson. And he's not by and, himself when he does this, is he? Yeah. He is. Oh, wow. Yeah. He just left yeah. the battlefield, jumped on, basically got in a boat, went to the boat base and got on the Monson. Mm -hmm. And I'm poor, you know, I've been a, a former um, ship, a, mar a Marine detachment on the ship, kn knew how to um, operate on ship and everything like that. So he got on the ship, met the captain, got, mm -hmm. met the Coast Guard landing guys and said, follow me, let's go. And apparently it was like ducks in a row. And you know, mm -hmm. the destroyer laid in and the other landing craft and they're going to get the guys out. It, with and we're basically in in you know in conjunction with the navy captain of the ship and, and the and only this, way you could talk to the guys on the beach is by semaphore at this point that's oh, no that, they haven't got there yet but oh, yeah they oh wow as they're getting there and that this this is what's so damn cool about this is this puller just says to hell with this i'm going to get my people he gets on this friggin' destroyer and just they go out there and they're, they're going to make this they're going to make this rescue happen um as they're pulling as they are pulling up near the area uh, the monson is met by pretty significant Japanese ground fire coming from the beach. Um, at this point, the monson starts to respond to that fire with return fire. Yeah, return fire, and that is one hundred percent correct. That Puller does uh, make contact with Kelly, or at least with Kelly's people, via semaphore. Do you know the exact story of that, Dave? I mean, it was literally, you know, I mean, like yeah. sending signals via signal flags. So Raysbrook, the guy I mentioned before, it left the radio, Sergeant Raysbrook. Mm -hmm. I guess, I don't know if he was volunteered or in his guilt or whatever. He was obviously being a communicator in those days, a new semaphore flags, which is a signal yep. flag. Morse code, code semaphore and everything else. Yeah, so you probably knew it there too, sir. Um, so he was well-versed in it. So he basically, and and on, once again, on my little Dunkirk video, I should actually show the site where he was standing. So he gets up on the ridge under extreme uh, fire. And he starts signaling uh, the destroyer. And basically, he goes back and forth. And, and I've read stories that Puller was doing the signaling, which I really don't believe in on this I ship. That. No, no. No, you know, they had expert communicators through yeah. that. No, that's Puller, right. Puller's directing it. The, the signalman on the destroyer would have been able to do it. So Exactly. They're, yeah. they're the expert. Far faster than Chesty Puller could have done. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So I have no doubt started. Puller's standing there saying, tell this man this. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Give him this message. Right. Okay. And, and, and basically, Puller's coordinating the landing craft, trying to get the landing craft. And it, I'll mention the, the semaphores, but they're basically saying, lay the, gun, lay the fire here and lay the fire here. Basically, a corridor. Give me a corridor of five-inch rounds. Mm -hmm. And they're laying it on the left flank and laying it on the right flank. So they need a, basically a corridor of rounds to hold the Japanese off so they could retrograde off that ridge back to the beach and get evacuated. Mm -hmm. So they started laying down some effective five inch rounds and the Marines started peeling off the top of that ridge. One company at a time. So you only two companies really in one company at a time. They started fighting their way um, out of there. Um, at this stage, some of the landing craft was hesitant to, to go in because they were getting a lot of inflated fire. So if you, if you look at the area, especially on the map, you got Point Cruise, which it's juts concave, out. right? Yeah, and it juts out. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese were, were on the Point, the Cruise. Point Cruise Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And they were firing infilade fire, machine gun fire from mm -hmm. both angles. From both sides. Yeah, on the Marines yeah. and on the landing craft. And the landing craft getting hit. And these are Coast Guard guys. And it's the first time these guys have ever been in combat, these Coast Guard guys. I mean, mm -hmm. under direct fire. So they were a bit hesitant. So I think there was a few choice words there. <laughs> and then you had the, the leader of the Coast Guard, um, which was, um, I think he was a petty officer at the time, uh, Douglas Munro. So mm -hmm. he was the leading, the, on the scene, he was the leading Coast Guard um, uh, of the landing craft. Mm -hmm. He was the leading guy in charge of the landing craft. So they started mm -hmm. pushing to, to evacuate these Marines. Yeah. As, as the Marines are getting off of that hill, uh, you know, and this is consistent with everything that it, it, it's happened so far, 
as they're pulling off of that hill, the fire, as you said, Dave, it's growing in intensity, the Japanese fire, because they realize that the Marines are trying to get out of there. They can see, I mean, you can literally see the destroyer blasting a path. So it gets even nastier as they're coming off the hill. Douglas Monroe, um, he orders his Higgins landing craft to to go. To just, we're going to go get these people. We're going to go get them right now. Um, he's up on the if you've ever seen an LCPL, this is not the Higgins landing craft with the ramp. This is the one before that, the model before that. You go over the side. Yeah, yeah. You go over the side, and there's two positions up forward uh, on the bow. And at that time, they were armed with machine guns. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that Douglas Monroe was manning a 1928 Lewis gun, yeah, which, is, which is a freaking cool weapon anyway. But I mean, that, you know, as they're pulling up close to the shore, Monroe is the one sitting in it, in his position on the bow of the boat, and he is laying down fire with this Lewis gun to provide covering fire so these Marines can get up on the boat, up in the boat, rather. And he say he keeps his boat there for a very long period of time under direct fire, does he not? Oh, yes. He's, they were probably about 150, 200 yards off. Um, he was there providing a fire. There was, mm -hmm. there was one of the boats that was actually stuck on a sandbar. Mm -hmm. so that it was trapped so the, mm -hmm. you know he's really um put himself between that trapped boat and the japanese mm -hmm. it, there, there's marines in the water and they're trying to free this trapped landing craft and that's why monroe puts his boat up in between there is he's he decides he's going to use his boat and his body as a uh, shield as a shield to to give these marines some time to get this other landing craft which is also under his command by the way to get it out of there and get it the hell away from the beach um he holds that station for several minutes it's not known exactly how long but it's just must just suffice it to say it's several minutes um pouring fire back at the japanese and eventually they do free this grounded boat and they start to pull away at that point uh monroe's craft he orders it to come about and withdraw. And as they do so, he is struck in the base of his skull right there and, and knocks him unconscious. Uh, and eventually, obviously, it kills him, but it knocks him unconscious. He falls from his position as the boats are pulling away. Um, rushing back to Lunga Point, um, the, the, his best friend, Monroe's best friend, this guy named Raymond Evans, who's actually, I believe Raymond Evans was driving the boat, if I'm not mistaken, right, Dave? He was the yeah, he was the coxswain. Yeah, he's the coxswain. Coxswain. Yeah. yeah, he's driving the boat. He, the, and these two guys were were like, you know, yin and yang. They were pals. They, they called them the gold dust twins. They were everywhere they went. The other one was not far behind. So Evans sees Monroe go down and they haul ass back to, back to the area. And it's almost... Again, it's like something out of a movie. As they're pulling up to the area, Monroe, just for a very, very brief period of time, regains consciousness, asks Evans, did they get off? And he's referring to the Marines, of course. And Evans replies in the affirmative. He says, yeah. And Monroe expires. He dies right mm -hmm. then and there. And These Coast Guardsmen acted as bravely as any members from any absolutely. service in the entire war. Absolutely. And, and Monroe was awarded the Medal of Honor. I think he's the only Coast Guardsman ever to receive the Medal of Honor, isn't That's he? That's hundred percent correct. Yeah, he's the only. He was the first one, and he's the only one so far uh, to have received the Medal of Honor. Um, Evans, his the coxswain gets. Uh, he, he's awarded the Navy Cross, but um, yeah, Monroe is posthumously awarded the the Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions there at Point. Cruz. And Dave, I remember that you you do a video where you kind of show where all this happened. And isn't there's, two of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's hotels there now, as I yeah, recall. Yeah, very, very well populated. So I did one called the Little Dunkirk. This is what the and, and the did Marines you coin that did. name, the Little Dunkirk? Because I've never they heard did. it called that before. The Marines at the time called it the Little Dunkirk. Oh, they did. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I have a I'll have a Douglas Monroe episode. Just as well. Like, okay. There's a couple other guys I want to mention in there. There was another yep. person um, nominated for the Medal of Honor. But it was um, downgraded to Navy Cross. That was um, Anthony Malinowski, and he was a um, a platoon sergeant pre pre war Marine. So they were coming off the hill. And Malinowski was there with a battalion battalion surgeon and one of the company commanders, and they come to a clearing in um, the area where I used to work in Honiara. Was right there. That was where my office was. 
right on the scene of this action of basically when Malinowski uh, did his action and, and what these guys are running down. So Malinowski is coming down. He sees a BAR, Brown Automatic Rifle, on the ground from a wounded Marine. So he jumps in his clearing and he says, I'll hold him off. You keep going. They go, what are you doing? He goes, I'll catch up to you in a minute. So they started moving back and they could hear him shooting the bar and it sustained, uh, you know, burst like a professional uh, uh, Marine would do, you know, short round burst. And they heard him firing for a number of times and then they didn't hear him firing anymore. And then one of the other Marines, one of the last Marines down the hill, they asked him, did you see Malinowski? He says, no, he's dead. So he held off uh, <clears throat> the Japanese there. There was another guy that hardly anyone knows about is a private called John Giles. He was a machine gunner and he was up on the Eastern the, the eastern spur and Giles was holding off the last Japanese holding off the Japanese with a, a, a lot machine gun the 1919 and he died in place too but he he was they could hear him firing his weapon he was the only one up there firing so it's all kind of um, brave stories on these guys but unfortunately they're still there yeah it's 18 the stories and your body is unrecovered yeah, and I've been on a few awards boards before and you know nothing like this uh, and i was on a silver star award board once and the question you get is how in the heck can you justify downgrading what these guys did to navy crosses and just it did not it doesn't make sense to me today i don't know how it made sense to them back then i guess maybe because nobody actually physically saw you know medal of honor actions usually the witness require, yeah an officer yeah. in those days officer had to witness and yeah mm -hmm. yeah and Casam and, and, casamento was another one which was lighter in the campaign was a good uh, example of that yeah. i'm so glad that policy has been revised hmm. yeah and, and i mean it, there's it, there, there's countless stories of heroism on the Marine Corps side and the Army side on Guadalcanal, and and these are just a few. And it seems, you know, the more desperate the action, uh, the more stories like this seem yeah. to come to the surface. Not that there, you know, on mm -hmm. any given day that this couldn't happen, but the more desperate the, the scenario, the more common the stories seem to mm -hmm. seem to be. Is that the Marines? You know, this famous last words. You know, oh, I'll catch up with you in a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rarely yeah. does that occur. I'll hold them off. Right. Yeah, rarely. Does that did. Occur. Did Chesty get ashore from the destroyer, or did he just watch as his um, watch? That sounds too passive. He was very active, but would be kind of wait as his um, Marines retrograded and were recovered. Yeah, that's an interesting. I haven't been able to verify that. You hear different accounts. Um, knowing probably what what puller how he was, I would say he was on one of the landing craft. He would right. jumped on the craft to go in. He wouldn't have waited on the, the destroyer. Mm -hmm. There's accounts of him on the beach um, mm -hmm. organizing these guys. So I, I believe that account. Yeah. That was the guy Puller was. Once he got there, he wasn't going to stay on the boat. He was going to go in there with his guys and share the mm -hmm. danger. Yeah, right. So the, at the end of the day, this is – it because after this occurs, after they get the Marines off of the point – out of the point cruise area, the attack by Edson and 2-5 is done. That that's it. It's 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 pretty much over at that point. Mm -hmm. But to uh, summarize, the Raiders failed the envelopment on the right, right flank, and the amphibious envelopment failed on the left flank. Is yeah, that what's going on right now? Rear, rear, on the rear, the rear, rear attack rear, failed. Yeah. All right. the holding action failed, and the the flanking action across the river by the Raiders failed. Mm -hmm. so is it the only defeat that the Marines had during the campaign? And is it because the Japanese had built a defense in depth so? effective that that they were able to because because were, weren't they outnumbered at this spot it was a number of issues one was obviously um, the planning um, was planned on the fly the organization um, was done very quickly communications fog of war um, underestimation of the japanese this is a, a time where we always talk about where the the japanese underestimated the marines where the marines underestimated the uh, the japanese numbers in effectiveness, they thought there were less less than the, that many Japanese because maybe it was a reconnaissance in force to start with to, to mm -hmm. find out how many Japanese were there. Mm -hmm. Right. These these are the fresher. These are the kind. Of, these are the Japanese that attacked. Uh, did a one of the fight attacks on Bloody Ridge, so they wasn't that heavily engaged. They were semi fresh. 
they were the freshest ones there, or, for, or among the freshest ones there. For yeah, sure. so some of the fourth Marines or fourth, sorry, fourth Japanese regiments were moving up, but yeah, these are the so, so there's a whole combination of eras. Okay, so so the results of this are that seventy United States Marines and and one Coast Guardsman are killed in action. Uh, and, and I should say, let me just say 70 Americans, because there's Navy corpsmen in there that yeah. could also lose their lives. And a further 100-ish are, are wounded in action. And as you said, Dave, this is the first time and the only time, really, that the Japanese defeat the United States Marines in a, a one-on-one infantry fight. And there's a message that is sent back um, to Japanese headquarters. And it's said that once the message was received that you know this is a, we 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 stopped them here we beat them here that is the first and only good news that came from Guadalcanal in terms of the Japanese at this point. Hmm. After this occurs, and this is September, what was the date again? 27. 27. Yeah, September twenty seventh. Not to be denied. A couple of weeks later. Moving on down the story here, the Marines try to do a very similar thing again on the night of oh, on the October 6th through the 9th. This operation goes significantly better than the first. Um, to get give a little preface to this, on October the 3rd, Japanese Lieutenant General Mariyama was landed with fresh troops. His mission was to set up artillery positions on the opposite side of the Matanikau with which to shell Marine positions in preparation for the late October offensive that was on the horizon. This course becomes Battle of Anderson Field, which we'll talk about next time we're with you, Dave. Um, over the next few days, the Japanese proceeded to do, well, they tried to do just that, and they started probing Marine lines along that area. Now, Marines being Marines, they are also doing the same thing. We're conducting active patrols over there. Vandegrift is aware of the arrival of these fresh Japanese troops, and this is what propels him to launch yet another assault across the Matanikau, right? Yes, yes. So they they planned this one a bit um, better than the other one. Mm-hmm. Um, this is basically going to replicate what they did with better planning. This time he's going to have five battalions um, supported by um, air and naval guns. And then they were going to basically eliminate these these Japanese from the mouth of Matanikau. Because once again, they knew the Japanese were starting to land these um, heavy guns. And if they formed a platform on the eastern side, uh, a gun platform on the eastern side of Matanikau, and, and later we'll see in October, Japanese are bringing tanks over. And that was going to be uh, basically a launching point or attack point that was going to be. And once you get there, once you pass that barrier of Matanikau, you can all go straight other than the Lunga River. You can go straight to the airfield. And they wanted to, once again, like I said if, at the beginning, Vandegrift wanted to keep them as further away from the airfield as he could. And the Japanese, at this stage, wanted to uh, attack across the, the Matanikau. So their plan, they had an offensive plan for the 8th of October. The Japanese did to take that, um, that side and push a whole regiment, the 4th Japanese Infantry Regiment across Matanikau and form a, a, a riverhead, so to speak, a base. Mm-hmm. And the Marines wanted to eliminate them before they could do that. So Vandegrift sends the 5th Marines minus um, minus 1-5. Five. One five, minus one one five. And he, it's under the command of a guy named Whaling. Can you tell us about Whaling? The Whaling Group? What is that? Yeah. Frank, Frank Whaling, isn't it? Bill Whaling. Bill, Bill, Bill Whaling. Bill Whaling. Yeah, well, once again, a lot, a lot of these old Marine officers, World War I veteran, Banana War guy. He was an avid outdoorsman, hunter, uh, expert shooter. Whaling uh, was the executive officer of the 5th Marines when the invasion began. And then the shake of commands um, couldn't have a colonel as executive officer, so they didn't want to send him back because he was very valuable. So they, they told Whaling um, to form a group of scout snipers because mm-hmm. that time <clears throat> the Marines had, they needed, um, they were lacking in, in experienced patrols, um, leading, leading patrols and scouting. So they knew there was a bit of a, a lacking in that. Um, so Whaling came to Vandegrift and come up with an idea. He said, look, can I pick out, go um, to the infantry units, pick out some of the guys with past hunting experience and scouting and patrolling experience, uh, form a small group, give them training, train them up. Then I would use them as like reconnaissance, forward reconnaissance guys, kind of related to the reconnaissance battalion of today's Marines. 
And then once it, once I'll do that, I'll train a number of them up. I'll send some back to the uh, units and then they can share their knowledge and teach other guys. And, and once again, uh, he started that and the actual patrolling skills of the Marines uh, actually improved. Mm-hmm. So whaling, the whaling group, whaling was given command of this small battalion of, of scouts and snipers. And I wish I'm trying my best to find more information. You'll find hardly any information on these guys. The chief scout was there called Daniel Boone. He's uh, <laughs> by his name, Daniel Boone. They call him Daniel Boone, He's a big giant Marine with a big red beard. And he was a legend, but kind of lost to history, his real name. I'd love to find his real name, but mm. I'm trying, I'm trying my best to find out that this group I really want to know more about him. But then he had third battalion, second Marines was brought over from Tulagi to be a reserve uh, unit. So Whalen was put in charge of the third battalion, second Marines and his small group of scout snipers, and they formed into the whaling group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their their goal was to, along with the 7th Marines, uh, the whaling group, this is, to cross the river again down there at the old fancy pants one log bridge and to move along the area where Puller was theoretically and Edson were supposed to do that very thing the month before and envelop and entrap the Japanese. on October the 7th, the attack kicked off. Um, three five runs into they they get up to the river and they kind of run into the same kind of a thing that 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 they did earlier uh last month. They run into some pretty fierce resistance right there at the end of the river, don't they, Dave? Yeah, so just like I said, the uh, the fourth Japanese regiment was their planned on the eighth of, of right. October was to right. do offensive and push across. So what they'd done. They pushed a company, roughly, maybe I think two reinforced platoons, across the Matanikau mm-hmm. uh, to form a small um, riverhead. So that a small pocket, probably about 150 meters down from the mouth, probably about 200 yards wide. And they had dug in, in, in trench positions. There was one story, and I'm trying to find out what five Marines there were. There was a number of um, stories that when the first Marines um, moved in there from the fifth Marines, some of their scouts had come upon uh, five of their scouts had been um, tied and bound with their hands and feet and they're all dead. So I think that was the first scouts that the Marines had sent out. The Japanese had captured, probably tortured and killed. So they ran straight into uh, these Japanese thinking they're on the other side of the river and they ran straight into this bunker complex and the two companies got pinned down of, of three, five and yet two, five there with them on their left flank mm-hmm. trying to, to move in. So they they eventually the Marines start to eventually gain ground there. It's slow, and they bring up half tracks um, with seventy five millimeters, seventy five millimeter artillery pieces on the on the inside of these half tracks, and they're firing at these Japanese emplacements almost point blank, aren't they? Yeah, it's very thick jungle. Um, I've got a lot of photos of the area. I looked roughly around the same time in the same month, and it's very very thick jungle. Mm-hmm. So the half tracks could only get up through the uh, coastal track, so they could provide limited limited support. A lot of this was in close fighting um, with hand grenades and and rifles and you know up close and personal hand to hand type stuff. So they were pinned down for the whole day and, and over a whole night. These and they so, brought operators up too. But artillery is indirect fire. Were they were they using these this artillery? Fire. Yeah, yeah, indirect. They're... Were they using this as direct fire? Yeah. I mean, how, yeah, they they, a, how do they fuse these artillery rounds to get them to detonate that quickly? Well, they basically had the um, the old French 75 uh, millimeter howitzers mm-hmm. uh, mounted on these half tracks. And that's mm-hmm. what they use. So I'm not familiar with, I'm not an arty guy. I'm an infantry guy. <laughs> right. So I don't know how they how they fuse them, but they were able to, because they were their anti-tank um, capability. That's what they were designed okay. for. Okay, yeah. Tank. So they had some direct fire capability then. Yeah, with the 75. Okay. Now it's half All right. Three. Okay. So by nightfall, the Marines do wind up getting through that area. Um, they hold the mouth of the river, or at least the area in that general vicinity. And the whaling group and the 7th Marines had crossed the river. I guess it'd be upstream, upstream by the bridge. And they had somewhat accomplished part of their mission, but they had not finished. Um, the following afternoon, they receive 
more Marines coming through there. H Company, 5th Marines under Captain Rigo. These are the guys you talked about the Valley earlier, Dave. These are the guys that wind up kind of getting in a, in between a rock and a hard place there, right? Yeah, I'll take it one step back. The, um, the night time came, the Japanese were still there. And, and what happened was the Raiders were thought they're going to leave the island. And this time, um, Edson was the overall commander on the scene. So Edson says, look, I need a company of Raiders to assist, bring up the Raiders. So they brought the Raiders up, one company of the Raiders, and they, they dug in at the mouth. So that night, the Japanese tried to attack out, and they did a, a, an assault um, kind of in the rear of the Raiders line and overran the whole um, mortar platoon of Raiders and killed something like 12 Raiders. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese main they mainly died to the man trying to go across the mouth. Uh, the rest of the Marines, the seventh Marines and, and, and the whaling group, because you still had, you had um, third or second battalion, seven Marines and first battalion, seven Marines under Hanneken and Puller and the whaling group, they were going to be the maneuver element. They were still across Matanikau at that stage. Mm -hmm. And then they crossed the next day on the night to get back to, uh, Two five, two five was on the left flank of of three five and the Raiders. The valley, and I mentioned it at the very beginning of the podcast, the that was the east west trail that went down and to the the valley, then it crossed Montanic out the one law bridge. So in that book, Into the Valley by John Hersey, which he was a famous war correspondent, he tells a good um, tale of going to that valley <clears throat> with H Company, which was the weapons company, and there was a couple other. Obviously, they were attached to. Uh, G company and another company and they hit a hit a good firefight and that book very small book but it describes their little uh, fight in detail and myself and a guy called Jeff Riker uh, from Missing Marines and he's written a, a good book on Guadalcanal too that um we're doing a lot of research to find two of those Marines that's mentioned in that book that was uh, left on the battlefield battlefield barrels bodies never recovered so they get in there uh, Rigo's people get in this valley and they kind of realized their mistake pretty pretty damn quick right i mean they're they're taking fire from from all well pretty much both sides and in the front and there is a bit of a panicking situation here from some of the marines it's uh hersey which by the way to your point the book into the valley is fantastic if you've never read it it's it's a short read you know you could probably read it in an afternoon honestly but it's it's absolutely outstanding but the marines start to some of the riflemen up forward start to panic and they're realizing their predicament and they're starting to break and some of them are starting to run um rigo is the one that stands up and and i remember you had said dave when we were talking about edson's ridge one of the best ways to stop marines from doing something you don't want them to do is to shame them and this is what one of the many tactics that he employs here uh, to get his Marines to turn around, retake their positions and hold that ground as he starts basically chastising them. And, and, and the Marines do indeed hold that area, don't they? Yes. Yes. And that's one of the things they teach you from day one and the history and traditions don't be the first ones to ever run. And the guys before you never did so that, you know, it's just pretty core. And there's a lot of good units that teach that. And, that's and this almost never happened in the war. So it's not like this is, a common occurrence mm -hmm. and, and and it was undone in this event as well hmm. so yes. the next day um the the assault continues the attack continues and they do they being the marines eventually do you know accomplish their miss mission on the eighth uh vandegrift receives intelligence that the japanese and this is important this is why this kind of unfolds the way it does here in a minute um Vandegrift receives intelligence that the Japanese were preparing an all-out offensive to recapture the island. Again, this is kind of a you know, harbinger for the Henderson Field battle that's coming up at the end of this month, October. Uh, as a result, he canceled the operation for the next day um, and ordered his, and he wanted his to get, rightfully so, get his units back across Matanikau along the perimeter to prepare for this this uh, assault. That's going to dig in defense right. in depth, right? The whaling group and 2-7 had reached the beach as Puller's group topped a ridge line to find an entire Japanese battalion in the ravine below him. So the assault is still continuing. Puller's people, this is where they they he 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 really gets some some killing done here, doesn't he, Dave? 
Yeah, so Puller was the, the I guess, the far left battalion. So once they crossed the Matanikau, right, there was this sweep in battalion. So the uh, Whaler group takes the first ridge, then peels off first ridge. Two seven under Hannikin peels off second ridge, and and Puller will one seven is going to pull off and go to third ridge, um, go down Hill sixty six ridge, and there's a place it's basically called um, Hill eighty during a fight. And uh, up to Hill 78, which is where the Parliament, Parliament House is now, for anyone that knows Guadalcanal. Um, so, yeah, Puller, he gets there. He starts to engage. They see the Japanese down there. They start to engage. Um, Arthur Sims, who's the regimental commander of the 7th Marines, is still on the other side of Matanikau. Basically orders Puller back. And Puller says, look, I'm engaged in a major fight here. I can't come back. And he, he does the old classic Puller. He gets on the radio. And says, <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> well, yeah, well, he, he did that after this, but he basically said, if you want to know what's going on, you come up here yourself, mm -hmm. you know, instead of being back there, roughly referring to him, you're back in the rear, come up here yourself and find out. And then he just cuts the communication off. Yeah. As Twining said, these old banana war Marines like um, uh, Twine, or, um, Puller and Hannikin had a tendency, and that's what they used to do in the banana wars. Once they left the wire or the, or the line, so to speak, they cut off all communications. You couldn't, couldn't communicate with them, which is very frustrating. But anyway, mm. Puller gets there. They get in, uh, engaged in a major uh, fight. So one of the fresh battalions of the Japanese 4th uh, Regiment was caught in this ravine. Now, if you, if Guadalcanal today, just like then, the ridges are coral coral ridges, so there's not much um, topsoil on there. So they're you very can't barren. Really dig in. Well, they're very, and also, and they're very barren. You don't see many mm. trees on it. But then you'll see the barren hills, and then you have the thick jungle, jungle in the valley. So the Japanese used to go into the jungle ravines in low ground because during the day, if they stayed on the high ground, the, the cactus air force would get them. So that was the nice cover of the ravines. Mm -hmm. so the Japanese held the low ground and the Marines held the high ground, so to speak. But um, but said, caught these Japanese in this ravine. And it was really only one company of the Marines, of the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, C Company, was really uh, engaged. So what they were doing was... Um, they were dropping the 60 millimeter mortars in on into the ravines. And it's, if you look to the ravine to this day, it's very steep on both sides and they were pinning the Japanese and the Japanese were trying to get out on the other side. And he had his machine gun set up and, and they were killing the Japanese. And uh, Puller basically said, worse to effect is an extermination or it was a machine for extermination. Um, he designed and they were killing them. All, and then it started to drop in some of the 75 millimeter, um, now, artillery and the Marines in, in that area too. Um, um, now, what was you very unique about that? The, the amount of Japanese that killed in there, Puller's one company of Marines killed about as many Japanese in an hour and a half than you know, two days at Bloody Ridge and one day at Alligator Creek mm -hmm. by hoping, mm -hmm. you know, times. That just shows how many of the Japanese they killed. They killed Roughly from Japanese estimates, this is from Japanese, obviously you probably won't find the, the exact account, but anywhere between six to 700 Japanese. So basically destroyed that whole battalion. So was the intelligence that Vandegrift had that the Japanese were going to conduct an all-out attack to retake the island, was that intelligence correct? Oh, yes. And, and, oh, yeah. and once again, it goes back to what I'm really drilling into in one mm -hmm. of your past uh, podcast with the uh, the naval uh, admiral with the intelligence it was a good podcast and it, yeah. it 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 really referred to how the the top level intelligence we're dealing with. so we're dealing with you know um what ultra or magic you know the, the yeah. japanese naval code and that's mm -hmm. where a lot of this information is coming from japanese breaking the japanese radio codes and radio traffic and everything so that was the information you read in the, the accounts of time he received intelligence but that was the intelligence they were getting right. mm -hmm. that level Exactly. And did this action by Puller's battalion defeat that attempt to retake the island? Oh, no, not in that one, no. because this was information that the Japanese, and you'll see later by the Henderson Field, that the Japanese were, were coming to everything they got with the largest fleet since Midway, a whole reinforced division. Right, they right. see everything they got. So down yeah. some, stay but tuned. It, yeah, but it defeated the Japanese uh, offensive plan for the ape to establish mm -hmm. that artillery base on the uh, eastern side of Matanikau. It basically yeah. destroyed the 4th Regiment. We didn't destroy it. it, it Damn near. It, yeah, it decimated yeah, it. And rendered them ineffective for the mm. 
well, for the rest of the campaign, really. I mean, they, we see them fighting a bit later, but yeah, it hurt them. But the, yeah. the, 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 the victory here is, is not so much the intelligence because that, that comes to play later. It's the fact that they denied the jet, that they being the Marines denied the Japanese that artillery position, which was the only reason that the Japanese wanted that artillery position on the other side of the Montana account was to support the offensive hmm. that's coming up at the end of the month of October, which of course is the battle for Henderson field. Um, we said it back in uh on the Edson's Ridge episode that after Edson's Ridge, you know, if if there is a turning point in the you know, again, turning point such a sticky term. in the Pacific War. Yeah, but if there's a if there's a turning point on the land campaign for Guadalcanal, uh, you know, it, it would probably be after Edson's Ridge because this is when the Japanese decide to send the kitchen sink at Guadalcanal. You know, they're kind of doing it piecemeal here and there. But this is when they send the kitchen sink. This is when they send everything. And it's all in preparation for this October 20th, you know, the, the Henderson Field event. This is this is all in preparation for that. And this particular attack across Montana Cow denies the Japanese that artillery position. It kills over 700 of the enemy that absolutely would have been used in that assault against Henderson Field, no doubt. Uh, and, it, and it just it. It puts a dent in their plans, but it does not stop those plans, right, Dave? Yeah, exactly right. And um, and to deny the Japanese uh, another further attempt to cross Montanaco at that stage, um, after the Marines uh, pulled back, Vandergriff left two battalions in a horseshoe shape, um, fish or a fish hook, not a horseshoe, fish hook, fish hook shaped um, defense line on the um, Montanaco itself. So he's left two far battalions on the uh, east side of Matanikau to keep the Japanese and they're getting ready for the, the, the Japanese then. And getting back to your point, Seth, with the yep. Japanese are reinforcing Guadalcanal right. when they, when they made a decision to this shall not stand and right. we're going to, we're not going to allow the Americans to keep it. And so they're initially trying to bring transports down. And of course the Cactus Air Force defeats that. And now they're starting to bring reinforcements in by fast destroyer down, um, the, the slot down the slot yeah and so that's what's happening trying to build up forces build up forces so they could retake guadalcanal absolutely and at this point it's a battle of attrition it feels like in order to keep that force that's being built up from having overwhelming for uh authority in, right. into retaking yeah we're not fair? We're, just, we're just talking about the uh, the land stuff here at the mm -hmm. same time this isn't going on, as you guys know, and you you discuss the naval stuff. There's naval actions going on. And more importantly, too, there's a lot of air action going on at this yep. stage. And, and it's just a major, major air action going on that we even discuss, which is, yeah. That's why it's so great about the Guadalcanal campaign. It's that three-dimensional that you could go in three different ways. Yeah. And, and, and every single aspect, air, land, and sea, it affects the other you know, it, it, if the united states doesn't hold air superiority during the day and i, I don't want to say we don't necessarily hold air superiority during the day because air superiority defined is that we control every aspect of the air and we didn't and we didn't because the japanese mm -hmm. still got bombing raids in and, and mm -hmm. you know things like that but by and large we do own a great portion of the skies during but the if day you, if you don't control the air you don't control the seas right and if you don't control the seas you can't reinforce the marines and, and get more marines ashore exactly so you're right it, it, it it's dominoes here absolutely and, and happily we did have reasonable not full air superiority we had you know, what you're talking about we never had air supremacy right we had um air air superiority that was kind of um, migrant. It was. It came in and went um, on an, almost on an hour by hour basis, but enough to allow us to hold control of seas. Again, not twenty four seven throughout, right? right. Uh, Savo Island proved, yeah. and Cape es Esperance, which we'll talk about later. Um, but enough to finally get some Marines ashore and some logistic support ashore for this battle, right? And, and which is going to allow us to prevail in the long run, but more on that later. And, and you know, the, the, the unsinkable aircraft carrier that is Henderson mm -hmm. Field forces the Japanese to move their people at night because, right. you know, this is where the, you know, Tokyo Express and the people coming down the slot, this is all because of the fact that 
that anything that moves during the day, the Japanese are terrified mm. that it's going to get hit by SBDs or Avengers or B-17s or whatever that are going to strike them during the day. So everything affects the other thing here on Guadalcanal. Mm. And it's, it's a, you know, there is no battle for Guadalcanal. You know, there is the campaign, and this is just one of the many battles within the campaign, and they all affect everything that follows mm-hmm. afterwards. There's one There's one thing I don't think I've mentioned in the other uh, podcast that one of the reasons um, I found it very fascinating is roughly the only time in the whole Pacific War where the forces were roughly even. Right. It's kind of like a, an even playing field. Right. It's, mm-hmm. you know, obviously. See, at the very beginning, the Japanese were kind of overwhelming, and obviously at the end, the the, U, the Allies were overwhelming. But at this stage, parity on land, sea, and air, they're roughly about the same. They they are, and and you see that. I think you see that more at sea, because I mean, you know, like Cape Esperance, you know, it was a pretty even gunfight. You know, mm-hmm. the Battle of Cape Esperance, it really was. It was a pretty evenly matched gunfight. And Savo Island, theoretically, you know, we held more guns, but that's a that's another story. But but yeah, you're right, Dave. 100. percent This is really the only time in the Pacific War that there is parity that that it is a mano e mano kind of a thing, um, man to man, airplane to airplane, ship to ship. And there's only a couple times where we out heavily outnumber them, or they heavily outnumber us. But uh, but such as it is. Um, but, you know, these are two battles, the Matanikau actions here that that are not extremely well known. But again, they influence things that happen later. And, and we're building up to this big event that's coming uh, at the end of this month. And by this month, I'm talking about the month of October 1942. And that's the battle for Henderson Field, which is, Dave, I mean, I we'll talk about it when we talk about that battle. But it, I think it's fair to say that that's probably one of the final nails in the Imperial Coffin at Guadalcanal is the October battles. Almost the the high point, yeah, high point of the, the Japanese offensive, yeah. mm-hmm. Pacific. I mean, if you if you don't count the China, Burma, India, or yeah, you know, that that field, I think they only did one more really offensive uh, attack that was in Bougainville. But other than that, this was the the high mark, high water mark of the Japanese offensive um, operations in the Pacific, yeah. right here on in that October battle. And the old what if you know we can discuss it later with the November battle if that would have occurred. I always find it symbolic that Bougainville is where Yamamoto ends up dying. Yeah. But, well, this October battle, what had we'll find out Yamamoto had his full attention, had a full yeah. attention. Every, the high Japanese, this was the number one priority in, in the Japanese. This October battle, this was it of, yeah. of Guadalcanal. This, yeah. is, this is where Emperor Hirohito personally inserts himself into the Japanese plans here. They send their best. They sent their best to Guadalcanal. The Japanese sent yeah. their best. Again, defeating the myth that Hirohito was only peripherally aware of how the war was going, yeah. that he wasn't really involved. Yes, yes, he was. Absolutely, he was. Well, uh, gentlemen, unless you got something else you want to add, I think that's a pretty good place to wrap this sucker up. Agreed. What do you think, Dave? Oh, that's that's good. And yeah, I had a good chat once again. I love chatting about Guadalcanal. <laughs> Bill, you got anything else you want to? No, you wanna... no, no. There's there's more to come. There is certainly more to come. Dave, you're going to join us for our Henderson Field Talk, right? Yes, I really look forward to that one. A few yeah. good stories. Oh, yeah. One but last thing I, I do John want to John Bassalone. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The Mitchell Page. And all Mitch the Page. Of, you know, yeah, as an Italian-American growing up, i got to tell you, I knew the name Bassalone. But um, before we leave this episode, though, I do want to say one thing about Chesty Puller, because I knew his son. In the 90, 1990 to 92 time frame, I was stationed on the Joint Staff. And Lewis Puller Jr. was a Pentagon lawyer that I worked with just peripherally, but I but I knew him. And of course, he had been a Vietnam veteran, lost his legs and part of both of his hands uh, to a mor- uh, landmine, I think it was, in Vietnam. Very famously wrote a book called Fortunate Son that won the Pulitzer Prize after I stopped working for him. I think that was in 92 or 93. And sadly, committed suicide in 94. And that really, uh, one of those suicides that's affected me over the years. But imagine being Chesty Puller's son. You've got to live up to that example. He joined the Marine Corps, served in Vietnam, was blown up. And, um, And really, I think, never 
and nobody paid attention to PTSD back then. Um, uh, and, and happily, I mean, it's, we pay more attention to it today, but, but certainly still today, not enough. But he clearly suffered from PTSD for decades and, and sadly decided to end his life. And I say about Captain McVeigh of the USS Indianapolis fame, people call suicide a permanent solution to a temporary problem. In McVeigh's case, he'd been dealing with the events surrounding the Indianapolis for 23 years when he committed suicide. He did not see it as a temporary problem. Right. And of course, with Lewis Puller, Puller Jr., he's never going to get his legs back and his hands, and, and, and he's never always suffered from pain and went through issues with alcohol abuse and, and painkiller abuse and realized realizing that this is never going to change. Such a sad story. Um, you know, and a sad end to such a proud heritage for not just the Marine Corps, but for America. And if you haven't read Lewis Puller Jr.'s book called Fortunate Son, I really do encourage you to read it because it really closes it. I say close the chapter on the Lewis Puller saga, but I'm not sure it does. I think that it continues uh, for every veteran suffering from PTSD today. And worth a, very much worth a read. That's hard to follow up, Bill. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, but it needed but it, to be said. It no, it absolutely it does, and and that, that is something that uh, that it, that is far far uh, too often forgotten is right. is the the remnants of battle, the remnants mm -hmm. of war, and I'm not just talking about and, you know and the as we'll stuff left a, on a battlefield. As we're here in a future episode, even. Lewis Puller Sr., Chesty Puller, wasn't immune mm -hmm. from these issues, right? And so um, no one is superhuman. Every one of these people we're talking about is a human being who's going to suffer from what they see, what they're exposed to, what they've gone through, the, the decisions that they have to make through the course of the war, and not even the famous, iconic Chesty Puller was immune. Absolutely. No, you're right. And once again, there's a lot of support now for, for that. And mm -hmm. obviously, you know, if anyone's suffering from that, they can reach out and get support. And the best thing to do is just to talk to people about it. Yeah, I'm very critical of VA for a whole bunch of reasons. But this is one area I think they do a good job. The Veterans Administration support line for people that are dealing with PTSD and, and anybody who thinks they want yeah. to harm themselves is very good. So reach out and, and get support if you know if you're suffering and you know, talk to people. There's absolutely a lot of help out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with that, we want to thank you for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast wherever you receive your podcast and give us a rating and review. We would certainly and do appreciate it. Also, if you want to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel called The Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast, and also look us up on Facebook, like, and subscribe to our page as well. Also, uh, once again, Dave, follow up on Dave's uh, YouTube channel called Guadalcanal Walking the Battlefield. He also, Dave, you got the Facebook page too, right? Yes. Yeah. You're still posting stuff on there. Every couple of days, I see things pop up on there. It's a fantastic uh, resource, both uh, Facebook and YouTube uh, Dave's, Dave's page is Guadalcanal Walking Look, a Battlefield. Check them out. Dave's videos are a national treasure they're, for they're anybody really interested cool. in this battle. I mean, you, there's nothing like seeing the actual places. Yeah. And Dave takes you there. So I really do encourage people to um, go visit his YouTube channel in particular. Where those videos are incredible. For those of us who cannot get to Guadalcanal, of which I am one, uh, <laughs> this is as close as you're probably. Say again. Hopefully you'll get there one day. Yeah, I'd love to get Looks there. I can take you there one day. Absolutely. I, hell yeah, that's a date, man. But, uh, soul group. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is as close as you're gonna get to being there. They're they're absolutely fantastic. And I I watch them often, actually. Um if you do have a question for us, uh please send us an email at unauthorized pacific podcast at gmail.com. And uh, once again, my name is Seth Paradin, and I want to say thank you very much for tuning in this week, Bill. Yeah, thanks everybody and and go check out dave's videos yep well everybody thank you very much for listening and watching and uh, we'll see you next week <laughs>